Welcome back to MDL Weekly. I'm Becca Scott here with Paul Rietzel and Marshall Sutcliffe. Hey, hey. And we are heading, heading into the grand finals of today's Emerald Division of the core split, which means whoever wins this match is going to go straight to day two of Mythic Championship 5, along with 27 of their competitors be in day two, get a big chance at that prize on day three. Unless it's Paulo, right? <laughs> oh, well, that's true. There, Paulo has a, a much bigger so hill to climb, must he, win two matches. He actually has to double trouble on Ooh. Seth. So this is actually, like, really tough for him. Really Absolutely. tough. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially because the matchup is a little less flavorable, right? Uh, what did you say? Already a tough matchup for him. You have to win twice. I mean, that's a big task. Luckily, he only has to play against Seth Manfield. So, you know, no <laughs> big deal. <laughs> no big yeah. deal. Let's look at the bracket and see what these players have done today already. Of course, Manfield went straight to the grand finals there after beating Dama De Rosa uh, the first time. The morning yeah this, yes. this is this is just a rough bracket I mean even if you just look at the far left side it's all Hall of Famers <laughs> you know like there was no easy way through this field regardless of how you're gonna have to go nope. but I do have to say that winning twice is mathematically challenging yeah, Very although, difficult. although, you know, we saw in that first match, Paulo did take game one, and, and fairly convincingly, you know, was way ahead and just and just won the game. And then game two, very, very close. Seth just pulled it out by, by kind of the, the closest margin before winning a pretty convincing game three. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a tough task, yeah. but I won't say it's insurmountable. And let's see, Paulo Vitor Domodorosa, the most accomplished player in the MPL, that, that's probably the person that you'd want to try to, to accomplish that's it. That's right. The first one's for vengeance, <laughs> right? And the second one's for the... For the buys. Sure. So. Uh, now I'm going to use that word that I love and Marshall loves for me to use, which is I'm very excited because I love the vampire deck and I was very excited to see a uh, second game that you were talking about when he mulliganed down to five and still just went in strong with that aggressive strategy. Down the line. Yeah, yeah. This, this is what we talked about, right? You know, Seth Manfield has been, you know, arguably the most successful player of the, of the of this most recent era. You could you could you could argue by some metrics mm -hmm. and a lot of the way he does it is by playing two versions of the best deck and then playing them real really well and seeing all those angles had a really close decision as to which, which cards to put on the bottom in game two he said to himself you know what i played this vampire's deck i'm well prepared i'm going to rely on my opponent having a suboptimal kind of slow hand worked out perfect stole game three and now here he is you know with a massive advantage and a chance to get to the uh, championship of the split Absolutely. Now, it, it, I'm just still, I would never put Legion's Landing on bottom of the deck. <laughs> I would never do that, but yeah. it was the perfect move, and we saw how beautifully that worked out. Yeah, he, if you he missed took it, a go risk. back, rewind, watch the VOD later. You've got to see. Yeah, you know, he took a risk, right? And sometimes you have to take risks, because what needed to happen there was Paulo to stumble. Yes. That, that's the key to that equation, and it did. And he knew, okay, look, I need these things to happen if I'm going to win this game. Those are the type of judgment calls you have to make. Yeah, well, odds are definitely against Paulo, I think we'd say, but because he does have to win two matches. But we do have the first of those ready. So let's hop right into the game against Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa and Seth Mainfield. All right, let's get ready here for the grand final. Paul, take a look at the opener here. We've got, you know, Vampires versus the, the premier combo deck in standard on the other side with Nexus of Fate. Look, it's up to... Uh, Seth to pile on as much damage as quickly as humanly possible, especially in this game number one where he will have a few dead cards in hand. How's the opener? Yeah, so Seth's hand's perfect. It's pretty much <laughs> it's the, the absolute great. perfect hand. Um, if he draws Soren, yeah, just... Huh. Oh, yeah. so good. So, so you're on the play. You only have to win one of the next two matches, and you have a perfect hand. How's that for a good, a good Not start? Not too bad. It's good to be Seth. Now, what about on the on the top part of our screen? We can look at uh, Paulo's hand. Yeah, pretty... Uh, Pretty reasonable. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the big issue I'm seeing is those two copies of Memorial to, to Genius. So, um, you know, Gross Spy oh. will be able to get one of them into play, but he really needs untapped land starting around mana number four. And here we go, Adanto Vanguard on turn two from Seth. And he's gonna combo off here. He's gonna activate it right away. You might be asking yourself, why is he doing that? It doesn't do anything, but it does. If any player loses four more life, that Knight of the Ebon Legion will pick up a plus one, plus one counter. And so he gets to do that to himself to get the counters, especially given that uh, Paulo's not going to be doing any damage to Seth anytime soon. Oh my God, he drew the Soren. <laughs> Hello, my friend. Done. Wow. Who shuffled this deck? I mean, what's <laughs> going on? What is going on here? I mean, if I had to guess, I would say Seth at this yeah. point, but I don't know. Uh, so 
Now the question becomes, well, he answered the question for me. <laughs> the question becomes, uh, do you Legion's Lieutenant and then go for it later? But no, you're just going to go s soaring into Champion of Dusk here. Y yeah, and the reason why you want to do that is because now you want to set up for the part of the game in which Paula might be able to chain together some root snares. And so the, the card draw from Champion of Dusk, digging you into Sanctum Seeker, Vicious Conquistador, or additional Sorens is extraordinarily valuable. So this is just an absolutely, I mean, perfect sequence for, uh, for Seth. <laughs> Finally, something didn't go perfect for Seth. He found two more lands and a one drop, but whatever. <laughs> He's still in really good shape. Growth Spiral's gonna get one of those Memorial to Geniuses that you mentioned, and he does find an untapped fourth mana source here as well. But boy, this clock is fast with this great draw here from Manfield. Uh, Paulo is facing down a ton of damage. Yeah, and, and already, I mean, it's, it's it threatening lethal. lethal. It's yeah, lethal, if he does, if he yeah. Doesn't, um, he has doesn't to root snare. snare. So he doesn't even have a turn to fire off a Chemist's Insight here. He just has to spend this turn casting root snare. Ouch. And with no copy of Wilderness Reclamation on the battlefield yet for, for Paulo, uh, that really can, kind of closes the, the, the door to potential comebacks. Wow. Seth Manfield with the beautiful curve out. This is what happened when we let Seth have seven cards. We saw what happens with five. It was bad enough. Now he's got seven, and he is laying the smack down here on Paulo Vitor Domitorosa. And let's not forget that Soren Imperious Bloodlord also on the battlefield still with those uh, plus abilities at the ready. Yeah, so if you're Paulo and you're trying to think, okay, how do I craft some path to victory here? You're going to have to root snare on every single turn that you pass the turn back to Seth for the rest of the game. So if that's the case... What can you really draw this turn? You need to draw Root Snare, right? Exactly. Yes. You know, because you can never yes. give him another turn where you don't Root Snare. But if you draw Root Snare, then you're not casting Wilderness Reclamation. You're not really advancing your game plan towards anything. So realistically, it needs to be something like Root Snare this next turn. Then the turn after that, Chemistry's Insight into another Root Snare and a land. And then, you know, and then a, a kind of a crazy sequence of things. So, right. Um, it's... Uh, Look, you know, it's not 100% um, over, but I would like Seth's spot so far. Right, and in the meantime, Seth is going to start working on the life total the good old-fashioned way, just using Sword and Prius Bloodlord to just throw vampires at Paulo's head. A blink of an eye off the top of the library. Blink of an eye, importantly, nope. not being a root snare. <laughs> right. <laughs> Critically not a root snare, and that is Seth Manfield picking up game number one of the grand final here. Boy, this one could be quick. Not time to go grab a sandwich. You want to stick in your seat here because uh, if Seth has another draw like that, we'll have our Emerald Division crowned here by the end of this next game. Now, things change. Right. So Paulo gets to consult the sideboard, of course, so does Seth, uh, and Paulo will be on the play as well. And we talked, and Paulo talked about in an interview with Paul earlier how important he felt Veil of Summer was in these post sideboard games. Not only the ability to stop the rest or something like Dispark or Mortify, um, but even possibly the, the ability from Soren, Imperious Bloodlord. So he really feels like Veil of Summer is kind of the, the Swiss Army knife in these post sideboard games that gives him um, you know, a chance to, to win a bad matchup. So. <laughs> Here's that hand we talked about earlier, the no one drop, no three drop. Importantly though, he does have something he can do on turn three after the turn to Adanto Vanguard. Yeah, seems like one of those mid middle line keepers, but it could actually improve if he gets lucky off the top of the library, though it didn't look like that happened here. So it's gonna be land go now from Seth as he passes a turn back, and Paulo has critically that growth spiral in his hand so that he can get ahead on mana and start to kind of skip a turn here. Yeah, it's really important. Importantly, you know, that, that um, Seth just drew that copy of Dispark because otherwise Paulo kind of has a perfect hand, right? Mm. With both access to... <laughs> And there Seth draws another enchantment removal. Wow. So Paula with access to both copies of the enchantment, Seth with both of the answers. Um, His last two draw steps were kind, yeah. and with enough pressure on the battlefield to force Paulo to react to him, this hand is actually developing very nicely here for Manfield. But there's that Veil of Summer that, that Paula Ooh. talked about, right? You know, so that's that's the key card, you know, that, that is going to allow him to potentially um, set up a growth spiral this turn and then next turn play the Wilderness Reclamation and protect it. Wow, these players like to draw good cards on the top of their library. <laughs> Seth, Seth with an opening hand that had creatures and lands and he drew the best three interactive spells in his deck in order in his first three draw steps. Kind so. of nice to be. Yeah. Now, is that going to force Paulo to just fire off the Veil of Summer here, then? 
I would imagine. Like do, he wants to protect the wilderness reclamation uh, in his hand. To me, the idea of dismissing or cryptic commanding something and drawing a card is just so attractive. It you would just, be very difficult for me to, yeah. to, to restrain myself. So I would be tempted to do so. Yeah. I mean, this is a big part of the reason why it's here. And, you know, you know, kind of importantly, the, the, the Veil of Summer's job was gonna be to protect wilderness reclamation anyway. And so, you know, step one is to make sure you don't have to discard it. By the way, I, I gotta say, you're the better salesman between you and Reed. Reed said on the last segment that he thought Veil vale of Summer was a game changer for Magic the Gathering. <laughs> and I was like, is it though? And then you just called it Cryptic Command for G, and I'm like, yeah. I'm in, Veil yeah. vale of Summer. <laughs> All right, so, Paulo's stable at 14 life here. He's just hit his fifth land, and he's cast Wilderness Reclamation. He has not transformed Search for his Cantha just yet though. Yeah, and, and his kind of, you know, he's missing one of the key elements, which is those those card draw um, spells. So right. really relying on Search for Azkanta to at some point flip during this game to get himself, you know, kind of deeper into his deck to, to really cascade his advantage. Wow. Jeez. So Seth's Seth four draw steps unreal. have been the spark, mortify, duress, duress <laughs> um, this game. Yeah. Yeah, and so now, you know, Seth is gonna be able to combine duress with probably the spark to take out both the wilderness reclamations from uh, from Seth, or duress plus mortify to take both the search for Ascantas out. Either way, leaving him without one of the key legs of the table. Right. We talk about the the three pillars of the deck: a card draw engine, primarily search for Ascanta, wilderness reclamation, and then digging around for nexus of fate. If you are able to take away all of one of those pillars, they really can't do anything broken. They can do value stuff, but they can't repeat it. Yeah, and I like this decision to go after the Ascantas first. The Reclamations on their own without card draw really don't do anything. And Seth's providing enough pressure on Apollo's life total that he's gonna have to use that Root Snare defensively sooner rather than later. So Apollo, a tremendous amount of pressure now on his next two draw steps. Yeah, he's actually gonna have to use it next turn. He faces lethal with the Sanctum Seeker. Wow, yeah. And a land off the top of the library for Paulo is not what he needed. What does he need? What is a what is a path out look like? A chemist's insight is kind of the card that he's really looking for in okay. this spot. You know, with two copies of Wilderness Reclamation, he's not really worried about how much total mana he has. He's looking to draw into multiple different cards to get himself out of this. So something like Chemist's Insight, which can help him tear through his deck, would be really attractive. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things where. Um, a lone nexus of fate probably doesn't get you out of this mess. You know, all it does is really just kind of find you one more draw step. He needs multiple, um, you know, some things here. Sanctum Seeker gonna put a tremendous amount of pressure on Paulo here. Now, this is one of those situations we talked about you know, setting up these Nexus versus Vampires matchups mm -hmm. where he has to use Roots Snare to gain just a little bit of life but can't even prevent all of the damage, or in this case, life loss, from this combat step. So we just see really the systemic inherent strength of this Vampire's deck attacking on so many different angles, discard, enchantment removal, life total pressure, tempo, really can kind of do everything. Yeah, card and, draw, like, it, yeah. it's insane. Now, this is gonna force Paulo, though, to use Blast Zone here to take down the two two drops. Now, one of them's gonna get indestructible, so it won't actually die, and in fact, is gonna go ahead and knock Apollo down to four. That does let him keep Root Snare in his hand. Uh, the Legion Lieutenant hit the graveyard there, but a force off the top of the library here for Domino Rosa, and all he can do is nothing. Yeah. And as you said, look at these Wilderness Reclamations just chiming away on end step, and nothing's happening. You so know what's fun? When your opponent has 10 mana and does nothing with yes, it. I love when that yes, happens. that is good. And when you're attacking them. Yep. So here's Root Snare just to keep Paulo Vitor alive. He's still gonna drop to two here. And we got one more draw step for Paulo or Seth Manfield is gonna lock this thing up on easy mode here. Only had to play against Paulo Vitor Domitorosa twice. How hard could that be? And he gets the job done. Seth Manfield wins the Emerald Division, and he made that look easy. Yeah, he just kind of sent Paulo out there to dispatch with everybody else. 
handle Paulo. He said, go ahead, you beat everybody else, and then I'll just handle you again, and I'm going to go right to this. I went to get that sandwich you kept talking about. I didn't see what happened. (laughs) Ran back over (laughs) here. No, I never left, and that was an incredible, incredible, very quick victory for Seth. Congratulations. Super impressive performance by Seth Manfield. Again, you know, he's one of the tougher players in this but also he had to face three Hall of Famers. In this case, only one Hall of Famer, but you know, one of the best players in the whole MPL, and he just dispatched him twice and said, yeah, I'll, I'll take that, thank yeah. you very much. I'm sure Seth is very excited, and we do have an interview with him, with Paul now. All right, I am joined here by Seth Manfield, the winner of the Emerald Division of the MPL Weekly. How does it feel? It feels fantastic. I've been stressing this whole week, it's been Pretty grueling, honestly. Not only did I have to play Esper Control against amazing players for seven rounds, but then the top four, I I was happy it went pretty smoothly in the end. I didn't. I only had to play two matches, which was fortunate. But yeah, I, I'm. I mean, this is huge for me for making it into next year for the to, to the MPL for getting a buy, essentially a full day buy, right? I'm, I'm not playing the first day of the the next Mythic Championship. I'll, I'll be competing in it. I'm, I'm, I'm floored. Like, I don't know if, if players have been following me throughout the years. They may remember I played a classic match against Paolo. It was a mono red mirror in... I, I remember yeah. that. <laughs> and I, I actually felt like I threw that one away. So and that was that was the top the top eight of a pro tour up 2-0. So to be able to come back and and we've we've gone back and forth. I, I won my first Grand Prix in in 2007, 2007 I uh was when I won it in Daytona Beach and he was my opponent in the finals. So you know things it's kind of crazy how things come full circle and here we are battling it out and i'm yeah very happy i mean yeah this is just another win for you i mean you've basically won every possible thing that you can in magic you know you've won a mythic championship you've won a world championship you've won plenty of grand prix and now you know also won your division in the mpl yeah i mean i i did not like my chances at the start of the week and i was really debating like i was i was doing some heavy soul searching late last night deciding uh what deck to play (laughs) so um you know it it wasn't it's not only what the games might look easy but just just the whole process of it is it's really i mean i i like it i like the chance to play against these other players that i know are great players and to have a chance to prove yourself against the best. And like, I thrive for the competition of it all. So for me, this, this was great. I, I like that after all that soul searching and, mm-hmm. and, and all that, you know, trying to figure out exactly what you need to do, you settled on stock vampires. Yeah, well, after I searched my soul, <laughs> uh, I, I searched, I, I went online and I, I asked for what the, the best deck in standard was. And the results I, I came up with was uh, <laughs> vampires. I looked at, I looked at everyone else in the league and I guess they forgot that I, they forgot about the deck. They missed the memo. So I'm happy to go ahead and capitalize on that. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a misplay. Now we have back to back weeks with Orza vampires taking it down. Maybe, Maybe next week the players wake up and decide to start playing it again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's been a good format. I, I, unfortunately, a lot of these vampires they'll be rotating out soon. But I've been the, watching the deck run for for these few weeks during the MPL. Um, it's been it's been fantastic. I didn't did not necessarily expect to play this deck because I do think it can be beaten. It's not like this unbeatable beast we saw like we are all great players right we were in the mpl so eight great players are not just going to if something is just beyond great they're not just going to not play it and we all decided actively to not play vampires knowing how good it was for this week but i think it was kind of this sometimes the format just kind of changes even from day to day you'll see someone pick up a ramp deck or you see or you will see mono red which pv and and martin played which basically was 
not non-existent last week. Like even not just outside of the MPL, just like there was like a mono raid, a different mono red list. Like that classic mono red with experimental frenzy was essentially dead. So to see the format continue to evolve, I've been enjoying the standard format. I've been liking it. And yeah, I, I kind of did. I've been pacing around my house, my around my apartment, just kind of did a, you know, my own little sprint around and uh, got got some looks from my my girlfriend and my daughter when I they were like, are you finally done? You've been stressing out for this whole week. We don't know what's going on. And I was like, I can finally let you know that I won. So um, to get that off my chest and yeah, it feels really good. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I definitely saw that piece with you and Brian Brown doing and Brian basically saying you are, you know, the person who puts the most amount of stress on yourself. But still, despite that, you have the ability to play through all of that and still, you know, not let that affect your game. Yeah. And, you know, I I felt like I put a lot of stress on myself the last split. I ended up going six and one with with the mono red deck. And I felt like, wow, I need to be able to come back and put up another good run in this next split. Because I didn't, even though I, I felt like I did well in the last split, I didn't get there, right? So it's just kind of continuing to, all right, you got a new tournament, you have to refocus. You're, and no matter what everyone else is playing, just just play your best. And I felt like I was playing, I played well in both in the regular matches and in the top four. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it looks like you completely crushed the field here. And again, I want to congratulate you for taking it all down, just crushing it, winning it straight two matches, and uh, and I'll be seeing you in Long Beach uh, for day two, not day one of that event. Sounds good. Best of luck. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> all right, that's how Seth's feeling. Interesting point he brought up that in the last, in the Spark split, he went six and one and still didn't make it straight to day two because his division, uh, I believe, had Brad Nelson in it. Yeah, that was... Yeah, six and one is great unless somebody else goes seven zero. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but this time it, I don't know. Maybe the, maybe it just suited him better. I don't actually know uh, about <clears throat> like how the format prior to this did, but this obviously suited him just fine. It yeah. sure did. <laughs> and imagine talking to Brian Brondwin and Brad Nelson about standard on a daily basis going into a big and important tournament, right? Like how 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 better prepared could you possibly be than that? Absolutely. Well, we do have the bracket of what we've seen today, how Seth made it uh, to be the champion of the Emerald Division in our core split here. Moving on to day two of Mythic Championship 5, starting October 18th. And uh, beat out uh, three Hall of Famers. But don't worry, they'll be at the Mythic Championship as well. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, friends, we're almost at the end of our day, uh, but just uh, final thoughts on, on what we might see in the metagame next week. He was talking about how week one we saw so many vampire decks, yeah. and then his uh, round robin, everyone expected them and no one brought them. Yeah, it's really interesting because what we actually see here are representative decks that people play in standard, but not necessarily at the, cl like, standard is not half Simic right now, right? <laughs> so you have to remember that there's serious leveling going on here. What leveling I mean is, I'm trying to guess what you're doing, you're trying to guess what I'm doing, and we're each trying to be one step ahead of each other, but not two, and not one step behind. And that dictates some kind of weird choices. In this one, it was because of Shota. Mm -hmm. Shota plays control decks. He's just known for that, and when people were deciding what to play here, they were assuming that Shota was gonna play his Esper deck. He did. That's exactly what happened. And they all warped around that. And so when it comes to the top four, you know, there's a lot of leveling. When it comes to the open play, you know, that you have to win just to make it to the top four, that's different. You know, now we're talking about a deck that is made for a ro more robust field that has to be resilient to multiple strategies where you have less information. Yeah, and you've seen a lot of different decks be successful in standard. I'm obviously vampires, people talking about re revisiting mono red. Um, of course, there's there's scape shift and a bunch of different decks based upon Teferi. I've heard some rumors of some crazy four color decks doing well in the in the Mythic Championship qualifier weekend tournament on Arena this weekend. So we'll see those deck lists tomorrow. Wonderful, we'll see some of them start to make a splash in the in the coming weeks. You still on vampires though as best deck? Vampires, of course. You know, it's it's like white weenie, but better. I, I already knew. Yeah. I love vampires. Now, if you want to know, if you want to watch some pros play other decks, you have a deck that's your favorite you've been playing in open play, you can go to magic.gg and check out the features. It's all on the Magic Esports site. Find full rosters.
winners for the players, results from every match from this core split play, and every single match they played in the round robin before we got to today's matches uh, is here on the website. You can watch the VOD, dive into what your favorite players did, or your favorite decks did. If we're talking about these decks that, of course, Simic Nexus is not what will come up the most often if you're just hitting that ranked player traditional yeah. play button. Yeah. Uh, so you can watch how these pros navigate those decks and uh, maybe take some tips for yourself. All at magic.gg. Yeah, and that's, I mean, if like, let's say you're a mono red player, you're going to Friday Night Magic, you're gonna play your, your mono red deck or you wanna run it through a Q on Arena, watching one of these MPL players go through their seven matches with mono red, I mean, how many tips can you pick up in that hour? So. It definitely yeah. made me a much better player getting to sit here and watch these excellent players and get to talk to uh, players like yourselves. Uh, and now, just want to say a quick shout out to the players in the Mythic Championship Qualifier Weekend of Views, as you two have just mentioned. That is this weekend, so by the end of Sunday, there will be 16 players that know that they're going to Mythic Championship 5, or at least have the invites, if they can make that work for themselves, and they've all locked themselves into their homes this weekend, duking it out. So uh, we'll see who walks away. Best of luck to the players who want it the most.